Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Ka Fang from Singapore. A uh, great privilege to be here to chair what I think is going to be the final session of a very exciting three day program that is coming to a sad uh, kind of close. But all set closes and endings have to begin again. So Tahira will tell us later when the next one is going to be. But we are on a very important theme. And this theme has become more urgent because of recent events happening all over the world. The theme is writing freedom. Uh, it can be constructed in many ways. What does writing freedom mean? The freedom to write? the right to freedom, having a pun on the word right. And when we think about it, as I was thinking, just to begin the moderation of this panel before I call upon Robert and Chai to share their views, um, I think there are two kinds of uh, freedoms that we need to bear in mind. One is a freedom that comes from the outside. And that particular freedom can be subdivided into many other freedoms, you know. The most important one is the freedom given to us by the law. Does the law allow us to speak uh, freely? As far as I know, no nation on earth has given any citizen the right to total freedom of articulation. Meaning that uh, even if there is no announcement of a formal legal kind of uh, barrier to total freedom of speech, there are assumed uh, barriers such as, um, you know, try not to get too personal in your discussions, try not to use vulgarities in your suggestion and recommendations and conversations, and try as far as possible to be respectful of views, even when you agree to disagree. And I think these are the three guidelines that I will use as well as chairperson for this very exciting session where we're gonna talk about writing freedom. So without further ado, because I'm gonna give people a chance to ask questions and interact and engage in the discussion that will follow the presentations, I'm gonna call upon Ki Tuan Chai to say a few words. I have no few now, words to say. You, you're gonna ask me questions and I will answer you. Okay, I will uh, uh, Chai, no problem, but I want to introduce you. Uh, most okay. people know Chai as a guy who will buy you a beer anytime, you know. But when it comes to buying a cup of coffee and tea, he's very reserved. And he usually leaves that particular sort of um, an action to the, uh, the guest. But as a host, I can't find of a better host than he because he always says, you come here, you, you know, take what I give you. And normally what he gives is very, very good beer. <laughs> but more than that, more than that, he laces us with beer so that off and on, we forget what he's really saying to us. And half the time what he says to us is, I wouldn't say a rebuke, but a kind of challenge, if I may put it that way, Chai. We've known each other long enough to know that, uh, you know, a challenge is very good. When I first met you, you were only 22. And at that point, I think you were a little bit, um, I wouldn't say uh, a, a feared, but I think you thought that this turban from Singapore coming from the other end of the world, I mean, you were from Penang. So between Penang and Singapore, we had this thing called Peninsula Malaya, right? And <laughs> in other words, we controlled the, the middle and it was very exciting, but that period is gone. Now centers have shifted, things have moved. So let me begin by asking you, Chai, do you think that with the physical movements of people, I mean, you know, from Penang, you are in KL, um, I was from Balu Gaja, Ipo, and I'm now in Singapore and all of that. Do you think that positioning, meaning your geographic position, has something to do with the freedom that you might have as a writer? Of course. La. I mean, you compare uh, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, Singapore is uh, certainly, in terms of uh, uh, relative terms, la, Singapore is certainly more controlled. Mm. But even though... That's the case. Uh, Malaysia is also very controlled. We have so many laws that restrict freedom, not only freedom of writing, you mm. know. Uh, and uh, it's 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 all. I mean, I personally have uh, uh, suffered some of the consequences of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we 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 have uh, uh, we used to have uh, 
the uh, Internal Security Act as you do have now. Yeah. Uh, and it, it means, it, it meant at the time that you could be detained without trial for, uh, at, at the pleasure of the Home Minister for mm -hmm. uh, uh, beginning two years. And after that to be extended every two years indefinitely, you know, according to right. how the, right. uh, the Home Minister feels. Um, and we've got so many other draconian laws. I mean, uh, the newspapers, for instance, they cannot operate freely because we have such a thing as the Printing and Printing Presses Act, uh, which uh, requires all newspapers to uh, renew their license, licenses annually. So imagine if they were to do something that uh, was frowned upon by the Home Ministry, they could uh, easily be suspended and even lose their license. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, all kinds of, now, now the, our Internal Security Act is gone, but it has been replaced by yet another act, which is called SOSMA, which is oh. supposed to be, supposed to curb terrorism, but uh, Malaysian social activists have been detained without trial under it, you know, and they sure uh -huh. as hell are not terrorists. Oh. Uh, and of course we have our racial and religious sensitivities. We have our Sedition Act. I don't know if you still have it, but we have it. And we cannot discuss uh, four sensitive issues within this, uh, uh, the, the Sedition Act. Uh, I mean, uh, one, one of them is, of course, uh, the sovereignty of the Malay rulers. Uh, and we have nine rulers, and one of them is the king of the land. You know? And you, you can't say you want to overthrow the rulers and install a republic instead. You can't even ex express it as an idea. You know, and you can't criticize them either. I mean, actually you can under circumstances, but nowadays it is interpreted so arbitrarily that even if you make justifiable, fair comment, you could be slapped with sedition. If you are perceived to be insulting any one of them, it may not even be an insult, you know? It depends on how the authorities read it. You could be called up. Uh, so that's how extreme it has become. Chai, while you're on this note, uh, may I ask whether the, the restrictions and all apply to academics and academic research papers? Of course, we also have what is called the uh, Universities and University Colleges Act, which oh. uh, has placed a curb on the freedom of not only students, but also lecturers. That has really taken away academic freedom. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you have are lecturers who are, who are, who are, who are more, uh, into apple polishing the, the authorities rather than uh, exercising academic freedom, rather than opening why, why minds. Education? Yeah, this was something that happened in the 1970s when uh, Mahathir Muhammad, you know him, heard of him, the guy? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he <laughs> was so damn, uh, you know, he wanted to control every damn thing, you see. So he decided to have uh, the uh, UUCA, the Universities and U University Colleges Act uh, amended at the time such oh. that the power was taken away from the university council. And he would, you know, after that, put all his men as vice chancellors of all the public universities. I come from University uh, Science Malaysia. At that time, uh, in the 1970s, I was a student then. We had right. damn good uh, uh, vice chancellor in Professor Hamza Sundut. And he yep. was an academic, he was just right for it and he was doing good things with it. But when Mahathir amended the, 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 the law, he then put in, a uh, civil servant. Can you imagine that? A civil servant then becomes a, uh, the, 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 the vice chancellor. I tell you, this, this, this civil servant sees things very differently. Uh. And because wow. of him, I was also thrown out of University of Science Malaysia. Yeah, so that's another story for another day. Yeah, <laughs> Kappa, we that is unfortunate. Huh? We can't see you, Kappa. Uh, just a minute, uh, because what okay. happened? Uh, can you see me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Thanks, uh, Chai. Uh, we'll come back to some of the things you said, but let me uh, now call upon Robert. Uh, Robert, you're a Singaporean writer, playwright, like uh, Chai, who is from KL, but Robert is from Singapore. Robert, over to you. Yeah, I want to say that uh, many of the things that Chai said about uh, Malaysia, mm. uh, accepting what he said about royalty because we don't have royalty right. can apply uh, to Singapore. Control, the press is licensed, things like that. 
but I uh -huh. want to I want to talk about something some some something else. I want to talk about 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 uh, something a little more uh, personal relating to uh, writing in Singapore, and perhaps share some personal uh, experiences. Uh, some please do, which, please do, Robert. Some of which uh, 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 Chai went through. I, I think there have been several articles in which Chai's theatre career has been compared to mine because right. we wrote plays which were, were political, which were controversial, and we had tangles with uh, authority. Okay, my position is like this. I wrote over three decades, three political place called Are You There Singapore, One Year Back Home. Remember that? Changi. Yep. Right? Yep. And when I wrote the first two plays, one in 1974, one in 1918, and one in 1997, uh, my position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the theatre and the promotion of theatre uh, was quite unusual. In 1974, uh, I was a lecturer in the Institute of Education and I wrote this play yeah. called Are You There, Singapore? Mm -hmm. And the play was staged in 74 without too many problems. In 1980, I tried to stage, sorry, in 1980, one year back home was staged, but actually I applied for permission to stage it and in Singapore plays are uh, licensed and I couldn't get a license for something like one and a half years to stage wow. this play called One Year Back Home. And consider this, in 1977, I was appointed chair of the Drama Advisory Committee of the Ministry <laughs> of Culture. Oh, so I, I was a known quantity. I chaired meetings in which there were representatives from the, from, from the, the three uh, 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 national languages, in, in other words, English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. So I was a known quantity. And I must tell you this story. Because when I applied for the, my play to be staged and I had to endure one and a half years of waiting, what I did was this. I could have said, forget it, and then my play will not be staged, which is not the way I work. Because I was chair of the Drama Advisory Committee, I approached senior people and I say, can you take it up to ensure that this play should be staged for the following reasons. So an enlightened civil servant called Michael Lowe took my case up to the permanent secretary, to the political sec secretary, and finally it went up to the acting minister for culture. This was in 1980, and the acting minister of culture at that time was Ong Teng Chong, who became president. And Ong Teng Chong was a, a supporter of the arts. Okay, so when the play, the permission to to stage my play landed on his table, I think it must have been September or so. The minister asked Michael Lowe, why is Robert Yeo staging a political play on an election year, 1980? But I said, Michael, please tell the minister that the application was put in last year. And the minister said, oh, is that the case? He let the play go and it was performed. But imagine having to go up all the way to the minister in order to get permission to perform your place. 
that is the kind of situation that I had to work with in the 80s. Okay. But so I Robert, could go on. I may, Perhaps yeah. you might want to ask me a question. Yes, Robert, if I may, if I may interrupt here. Do you think it was more a problem of bureaucracy rather than ministers having a final decision? Meaning the people below who were actually looking at your script and all that were, in today's jargon, a little bit kiasu. Oh, they were scared. I think in one yeah. of my plays, it might have been, uh, I think, Are You There, Singapore? Yeah. Uh, when it was finally approved, it was signed by the person in the department called Controller of Undesirable Publications. <laughs> <laughs> now, all this that. is documented. Yep, yep. <laughs> if you have a copy of uh, uh, the Singapore Trilogy, the yep. uh, interview <laughs> I gave to Ban Ka Chun, you can see very clearly that I actually got a letter to say, Dear Mr. Yeo, we have no objections to the staging of uh, Are You There? Singapore sign. It's really such a position uh, in Singapore. Yeah. Control you, see, you, you, you see, you go to remember <laughs> this, Chai. During that period, we were in the period of the Cold War. And civil servants who vetted plays and so on and so forth, look at a script, look at a script actually, and see if there are references to things left, things red, things pinkish, things communist, <laughs> and they will yep. be underlined. Yep. Remember, we were in the period of the Cold War. And I actually yeah, said, no. Cold War or not, in Singapore, whenever they see red, they, they just, they just uh, freeze. Uh. <laughs> it's nothing to do with the Cold War. Uh. You know, they've got this, this uh, you know, chip on their shoulder about the reds. Uh. Right? <laughs> but, but, am I right but, or am I right, guys? But if you have a chip <laughs> over your shoulder over, over the reds about communism, it, it means the Cold War, isn't it? Yeah, Malaysia too. <laughs> I agree. Malaysia too, yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that, but having said that, Kapal, having said that, yeah. uh, I went on to uh, write Changi yeah. in 1997, and Nai Changi was passed just like that. By yeah. that time, things had ease already. Changi, Changi begins in Changi prison with Fernandez, the main character, being questioned by the ISD. Not the kind of beginning that will make the Singapore government or the ministry responsible for giving licenses to place comfortable, right? Yeah. You agree? If I may interrupt, uh, Robert, for those uh, people listening to us around the world, ISD in Singapore means the Internal Security Department. That's right. It was a uh, leftover from the British colonial rule. Yeah. We still, yeah, have the, 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 we still have the Internal Security Department, but like in Malaysia, uh, it is here Special to branch take care Malaysia. of, uh, yeah. of terrorists, Correct. not political dissidents. Correct. My play was about top political dissident, yeah. a political dissident in 1980, and at the end of the play, he was arrested in 1982, J.B. Jeratnam won the constituency of Ensign, and for the very first time in Singapore, there was an opposition in Parliament. So, in a sense, I think my play was, well, how shall I put it? Please Robert, see. I think just for the historical record, before J.B. Jayaratnam came, there was the Barisan Socialists. Some members yeah. of them were in Parliament, but somehow they got uh, disbanded, right? That's right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Chai, if I may turn to you, is there a similar or equivalent story, the one that Robert has told, also happening in uh, KL or yeah, Malaysia yeah, or, or happened? Yeah. My own personal experience as a playwright. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a play called 1984 Here and Now, yep. which was, uh, uh, which satirized, you know, Malaysia in, 19, in the 1980s, when right. Mahathir, of course, was the uh, prime minister. And right. I satirized Mahathir as big brother. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was uh, it was a play that was you know out and out edgy propaganda, edgy yep. prop play. It was in your face because in those days in the nineteen eighties, because of the strict control of the mainstream media, 
And we didn't have an alternative media then because Malaysia Kini came about only in 1999. So in right. 1980s, everything was very controlled. You couldn't say anything in the newspapers. They wouldn't publish uh, anything that was critical of the government, right. none at all. You see, we used to have a, 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 a joke in the newsroom uh, that when he comes to Mahathir, everything goes, you know, he just has to fart and he'll get 10, col 10, 10, uh, 10 inches <laughs> or 20 inches per column, you know. But when he came to discussing the issues of the day, that was taboo. So I, I was very frustrated. How else could I bring across my, uh, express my uh, dissatisfaction with uh, the government? So I decided to write a play called 1984 Here and Now, which was actually adapted from Orwell's 1984 novel. Uh, yep. But I, 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 you know, I, I located it in the Malaysian uh, milieu. And uh, in fact, we were quite surprised that the play got passed because as Robert says, you know, uh, in Singapore, you have to uh, get a staging permit before yep. you can mount a production. It's the same with Malaysia. It still persists today. Right. And, uh, so uh, we submitted our, uh, our this uh, production plans to you know and who you know who would uh, arbitrate on on who would give you the final uh, approval special branch of the police you know why because they are you know great arbiters of culture you know so they they know culture best right so yes. they will give you the, the green light <laughs> and to our surprise we actually did get our green light uh, then word went around saying that hey, everybody go better go and see it on opening night because there may not be a second night. Yeah, right. I remember which was, that. <laughs> which was good because then we had full houses every night. Too long. Yep. But then the problem was after the fact. Uh, at the time, uh, K. Das, who is uh, you know uh, a, a very good journalist, one of the best Malaysian journalists we have, and I have great respect for him. He wrote something about the the, the play in uh, the Far Eastern Economic Review. And in it, he was asking the question, how come the play got the staging permit? Were the cops sleeping on the job? <laughs> so uh, after that, uh, my next production, I, wasn't, I was just acting in it. It was a one-man play. And it was actually a Singapore play called The Coffin is Too Big for the Hole. And it yep. was totally not uh, contentious in the Malaysian yeah, context. You know? yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. So, because of uh, 1984 here and now, which I had written, and now I was acting in this, uh, the coffin is too big for the hole. You know what happened? The authorities refused us a staging permit on the day the play was supposed They're to supposed open. perform. Right, yeah. So you yeah. imagine all the time, effort, money invested into it, wasted. So yeah, we have that problem too, you know. That was a sad we, moment, yeah. Robert, I don't think we have had an equivalent in Singapore, have we, or have we? I think Yelan Govan has gone through that process of... Uh, uh, Last-minute censorship, huh? Censorship, and, and, and the play did, did, did not go on. And there have been earlier cases. Mm. I, I, I recall a play that Chan Hing Wing wanted to put up called Tiny Alice. Right. Edward Albee. Given yeah. a license, but last minute withdrawn, and the play was uh, never staged. Why? Yeah? But that was not for political reasons, right? No, I think that was for religious reasons. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we but, have uh, our own religious sensitivities too. Yeah. But so what, in, I, uh, yeah. what I said about the fact that his play 1984 had to be approved by. Yeah. Uh, home affairs did you did you did you say by the police la, eventually. By the police. Well, yeah, we have also... a similar case for many years we had pelu yes, right. entertainment licensing unit and it was a section of the cid correct the uh, argument being that uh, theater is live performance and if there is a riot only the police can control it that's why it came under the cid right Belu, Public Entertainment Licensing Unit, Pearls Hill, Singapore. There's no Pelu anymore. And I think now uh, it's gone to another ministry. So policing uh, today is no longer what it used to be in the 80s and 90s. So if I may chip in here, I think both in Singapore and across the causeway in Malaysia, things have obviously loosened up and people are a little bit 
more relaxed about a lot of uh, things that were very highly sensitive in the past. Are there new areas of sensitivity that you think are either emerging or have just recently emerged that has put the authorities on alert again? May I begin with Chai? Chai? Not, not, not necessarily newly emerging, but there are those that have uh, been there perennially. Okay. The racial and religious sensitivities. Right. Yeah. And of course, uh, when it comes to uh, racial sensitivities, uh, if you say something that was uh, considered to be racist and, uh, uh, and so on, you, you could be hauled up for sedition. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, I, I mean, it happens a lot of the time, but usually the, the, the people who, who, who say, make certain racist remarks tend to get away with it. In fact, right. even, even government officials make racist remarks. But as long as you make uh, the remarks against the correct race, you're okay. Right. 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 You may against the correct race, the government condones <laughs> it, that's fine. <laughs> you won't get hauled up. But if you try something else, if you do it on a, a, a particular race, then you're going to get hell. The other one, of course, is religion. You right. do, not, do not insult Islam, which is the religion of the Federation. Right. Yeah. And uh, if you do that, you'll invariably be called up. Well, so in these Singapore, things don't go Robert away. Yeah, in Singapore, Chai, the, the situation is a bit different. I think Robert can uh, give us the specifics, but lately there's been some debate. And just in uh, the Straits Times of Singapore two days ago, they were again raising the issue whether uh, legislation should be passed about race, articles dealing with race and racism and all of that. Am I right, Robert? I think the Prime Minister in his speech uh, after National Day, but it, it was a National Day speech, yeah. said that there is going to be a new uh, new legislation for the maintenance of racial harmony, harmony. Correct. in yep. Singapore, in which uh, all the laws relating to uh, race uh, will be centralised in a new bill. I yep. think and this was as a result of recent racist in incidents, yes. which I think ha has been a little bit uh, uh, shoveling. Yeah. And uh, what is the substance of the law? To, 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 to legislate against race, to, to legislate in such a way that people will not say or do things which will harm racial harmony. We Is are proud of racial harmony, harmony, racial harmony bill. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Mainten maintenance of racial harmony. I think but that's the, 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 the Is key. it uh, to legislate against uh, hate speech, for instance? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, and of anything course. Anything that be uh, considered as being perjurious to a different racial or ethnic group or religious group. Yep. But that does, doesn't that uh, contravene your freedom of expression? It doesn't contravene, well, it does curtail. <laughs> yes, it will, it will. <laughs> but, but, as we are but, in. <laughs> but you, 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 look, you look at things like this, for instance, the Prime Minister highlighted the uh, uh, forms of racial prejudice, which could occur, for instance, in the case of uh, advertisements for jobs. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. You see what Fair I mean? Enough. And Fair secondly, enough. secondly, rental. If you are a landlord, you can discriminate against a particular race. Right. Things right. like that, I think, need to be legislated against. Yes. I think that's good. very obvious areas of uh, 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 open discrimination, Chai. Yes, yes. And it's interesting because uh, in Singapore, because the, the Chinese are in the majority, you yes. have a tendency, a greater tendency for the Chinese to discriminate against the non-Chinese. Yes. Which I, therefore, I think it's a, it's a very good idea to have a law like this, which does not discriminate against non-Chinese, right. against the marginalized groups la, or the minorities. Right. La. minorities. I think that's very good. Yeah, minorities right. rather than marginalized. Yeah, the mi minorities. Yeah, my yeah. bad. All right, so far we've been talking about quite directly the, the politics of this. What about the literary angle, meaning when you're writing a play uh, or writing a poem or a novel or a story, 
that actually touches on um, ethnic issues. I mean, it's difficult not to refer to them or not to mention them or not to actually describe them because we live in societies that are, by definition, very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, and all of that. So do you think as writers, you guys are always conscious of it or do you write first and then begin to become conscious when you reread it? For me, I've always been very conscious of it because you have to be aware of the ethnic sensitivities. I mean, there are okay. so many ways to skin a cat, right? Okay. So you find other ways to express. Yeah, you don't go for the jugular and uh, end up uh, hurting or offending people's sensi sensibilities when it is not really necessary to do so. Of course, there are certain things that you have to call a spade a spade. Right. All right? And you have to say, yeah, this is not right. And uh, you may belong to a different race, but I got to tell you this very frankly, what you're doing is damn wrong. Okay. All right. In that case, then you go ahead and say it. Yeah. Okay. But of course you don't do it in such a way that you go and then say, you know, your, your, you, you know, your race things, la, you know, your religion sucks, that kind of thing. No, you cannot you do never that. No offense, la. try not to be no. offensive, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you have to offend to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but not to the extent of uh, offending without boundaries. Correct. All right. You Correct. still have to uh, realize that uh, these people have a human right, a human place. And therefore, they will not see you, they will not agree with you, of course. They, will, they have their own truths. They have their own right. beliefs. You see, right. you, are, you are foisting your own truth and your own beliefs on them. Right. So you have to be very careful. Even if you want to win them over, you have to find certain strategies. I mean, I hate to use this because uh, it sounds very political, but mm. you still, you, you don't go out and offend people because then you will never win them over. Right. Robert, what about the view from Singapore? Well, I don't write uh, about race, language, religion, but when I do write, I am aware of what in Singapore is known as out-of-bound markers. Things which, uh, well, I, I don't, I, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to write in, in, in such a way that I will denigrate or offend a, a race or a religion, unless, of course, it is a case of interpretation. Let me give you an example. One year back home, sorry, my Singapore trilogy is about political dissent, about imprisonment, about unwed mothers. And in nine, year 2000, when I applied uh, to the National Arts Council for a grant to publish the play, it was turned down. And it was turned down because the NAC took the view that my place is critical of the ISD. And I'm referring to Changi. They actually said that uh, they turned down my play because it seemed like I was critical of an important public institution. I actually have a letter <laughs> that fact. So I think sometimes it's a case, uh, uh, Kapal, where are you, Kapal? Thanks, Taking a toilet break. Yeah. Like Sissi Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Kapal, you got to carry a bag. But carry on, yeah. carry on, Robert. Robert, we're listening, we're listening. Oh, You're listening, what, yeah. what, what, what was I saying? I was saying saying about oh so yeah. They refuse yeah. to let you publish a book. Uh... Yeah, right. Because because it, it would seem like I was very uh, critical of the ISD. I I I feel that as a writer, I would like to push the, the envelope, to push the boundary, and see what I can say. I've made this point in Singapore. My plays are not experimental, unlike Chai's plays, which are experimental. Because oh, in Owens. In Some Singapore, of are also experimental. I think because in Singapore, it's more important to push the boundaries of what we can say rather than the form of the play. 
Right. I wasn't terribly interested in the, 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 the form of the play and so on, because Chai's plays are quite often post bonnet allegorical and so on. I right. was interested in, 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 fi in finding out how far can I go if I want to say something? How far can I go if I want to express my views about political dissent, to say to the government, don't be too hard on political dissent, to say to the government, you just have to and tell them like Robert. it is. You don't use the guys. <laughs> Wake up, man. Uh, this is the 21st century already. Uh. What are you trying to do? This is supposed to be a democracy, right? This is what I will do. I do that at home here. You know, I tell the uh, I, I I speak truth to power. I tell these uh, yeah. people who are at the helm of uh, government, wherever they are. You, you have, them, yeah, you have you cannot a, do you this kind of thing. To, you know, you cannot yeah, you just put a a a in into, uh, under uh, SOSMA or under the Sedition Act, which still lives today in, in a different form, and, and, and then just uh, shut them up. Or then we also have something called Article One Two Four. You know, and and these are these are draconian acts. These are these are insidious. We cannot have that anymore. Look, and and you got to give uh, you got to honor what is in the federal constitution which is that let me ask uh, both of you uh, right let me ask both you both of you uh, chai and robert uh, a serious question i mean even in the western democracies right first it took centuries if not millennia for even the word democracy to be actualized yeah and even after the word was actualized it took more centuries for them to begin to release I mean, you remember that even when Shakespeare was writing his plays, there was, the censorship was terrible. And, uh, you know, actors were, you know, excised from uh, their roles and all that, simply based on uh, the fact that the other said something wrong or they acted in a play that was deemed to be this uh, respecting of royalty and all of that. Now, I mean, I don't think there is utopia anywhere in the world because utopia by definition means no place, right? Yeah. But in a society that is as complex as the society of Singapore and Malaysia, in such societies, isn't it in a way fair to say that the writer has also to be very careful? And here we are talking not just about the freedom of the playwright, but also freedom of the poet, the novelist, the fictionist, you know, short story writer and all of that. And even writer of just essays and articles. Uh, Kapal, in Singapore, I thought, I thought we already Kapal? addressed that earlier. We said we, we wouldn't uh, offend racial and religious sensitivities. Correct. But the complexity resides in the fact that if your character, say you write a novel, and there are five characters, but one of the characters, say belonging to ethnic X, ethnicity X, is always the villain, then some critic might say, why is this particular ethnicity or groups of that ethnic uh, group uh, you know, people, representatives of that group always sort of, you know, uh, vilify in that particular, you know, author's writing and all of that. Do you think there is a, a role for an arbiter and arbitration in this respect? No, no? that's uh, dangerous. That's dangerous. How can, how can you give him to them because they have this weird interpretation? The interpretation, interpretation is theirs. It's their responsibility, not that of the, the, of the writer. The writer did not intend it. They, they choose to see it as such. You know, it's like uh, some films, you know, in the Hollywood films, they see, oh, well, how come the black man is always, uh, uh, you know, vilified? How come he's always a uh, uh, drug pusher? La? He's uh, this and that, la? he's the villain. La? No, I mean. I, so. I want to say that Chai is right. It's a matter of interpretation. Uh -huh. and, and in my case, I have uh, applied to the NAC and funding ag agencies and their interpretation of my works is that I have insulted, that is that I have uh, denigrated public institutions. And in many cases, I think something a little more subtle, censors cannot read complicated texts. <laughs> yeah, they're not subtle. They can't read. Let they're me give you subtle. a name. Uh, let yeah. me give you an instance, okay? Yeah. In our case, we, ours is the police. <laughs> but you mm. see, the thing is, yes. because they interpret you wrongly like that, you have to fight them. You have to tell them what the hell you don't know how to read. You know, well, of course. You don't know how to read complex texts. Let me explain to you, you know? Wow. And then next time, uh, you make sure you don't do that to me again. That's Chai, how it goes. Chai, 
I'm the problem, sorry, but that's the, problem, the way it is. The problem is, okay, you, 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 you do it this year, five years later, there comes a new group of people who cannot read. And are you going to be spending all your time educating you, them? That's how it goes, man. That's life. Every time there's a new group that doesn't see the, mm, the truth, you got to yeah. keep the, telling them, man, hey, man, you wake up. You got let me tell you this. That's 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 reality. We, well, we the thing to do time. would be for government agencies to employ people who can read. Difficult ah, things. They don't right? want to do that. That's the damn thing about government. They don't want to do things like that. They want the most yeah. dumbed down person to be in charge of these right. things. Because why? Because they don't know how to read and then they are damn obedient. <laughs> they will listen. They will do what they, they will second guess. And these are the bloody little Napoleons who are the most insidious group of people, especially those because they will second guess what the, the government is thinking. And then they will do all those nasty things that uh, maybe the government doesn't even want them to do. You know, <laughs> they're only assuming. They think that oh they're doing by doing that they are they are, they are, they are serving the government well, but in fact they might not be. Yeah, yeah this is can I uh, can I shift the about. discussion in the final moment just to a slightly different topic? Okay. Um, many writers in most societies depend on governments for funding. Right. So in Singapore we have the Arts Council that gives out grants. Huh? Then you apply to you know publish a book of poems or anything like that. I I think there is the same with your Devan Bahasa right in Malaysia. So do you think that if you depend on government funding, there is at least a, a, a role for what we may broadly call courtesy to the people who are funding you? Or, you know, in the old days, you used to call patronage, right? You, you, you get a patron to publish your book, but you don't damn the patron in uh, accepting his money, but also damning him for his gesture, right? You so where do you think you draw the for, line? You should huh? never go to the government for patronage. That is your death knell. Because uh -huh. then the government will, will impose all kinds of conditions against you. Do you want that? Is that your so let's hear from Robert. as a writer? Because Robert, will Robert you get has, your freedom? So huh? let, let's listen from Robert Chai because Rob, uh, okay, Robert sorry. has direct experience sorry, of this in terms of funding. Yeah. All right. Robert? Mm. I have uh, in, in 2000, sorry, let me, in 2012, my opera. I didn't write yeah. the music, I wrote the libretto right. called Fences, yeah. which is a sort of Romeo and Juliet story about a Muslim girl in London, mid 60s, who falls in love with who else but a Chinese boy from where else but Singapore. Right. Of course, and then when they come home, they face parental objection. In this Libretto, I put in very sensitive li lyrics spoken by extremist Malay choruses. This, of course, is imaginative in, in, in the 1964 riots. And mm -hmm. I use actual words from Albert Lau's history book about Lee Kuan Yew and separation. Yep. And I would put in the choruses, they are like Greek choruses, things like uh, 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 arrest Lee Kuan Yew. You know, he is the enemy of, of the people. Sensitive things like Puko China. Yep. So my lyrics and then Lee Kuan Yew uh, resisting a notion of a Malay Malaysia and say we want a, Malaysia, Malaysia, Madeka, solidarity, and that sort of thing. And the long and short of it was that uh, I was turned down. The opera, which needed a lot of, of money, couldn't attract funding. And I come down to this very subtle thing. The census cannot read right. the text. There was nothing there which if it's Romeo and Juliet thing, it will come out against race and against religion because the two fathers objected to the marriage on the grounds of race and religion. And I wrote against it. But yeah. the yeah. census cannot read, and so I didn't get my money. Yeah. Denial of money is a form of censorship. 
Of course. Let's not forget that. Which is why we should not go to the government for patronage. They will what censor alternative? you. All right. Chai, Chai, what is the alternative? Yeah. I've got two many. I've I've got three manuscripts now that cannot attract money. What's the alternative? I don't believe in spending my own money. That is self-publication. And that for me, a self-publication is for me an ego trip. I can pay for it. But you can pay for it. You can yeah. pay for it. Yes. But you won't, you refuse to pay for it. Yes. Why? I think that my work should be attractive enough, important enough to be able to attract an enlightened government who employs people who can read my text. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic sorry. if you like. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is a Singapore government. <laughs> Let's be frank that, right? about it, Robert. Yeah, you you're, 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 the you're the practicing wishful thinking. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. you know, if you can afford it, go ahead and publish it if you want to be heard. Or you go and find somebody in the corporate sector, private sector, who might be uh, sympathetic. Also, huh? Empathetic. Mm. Hopefully, you know? hopefully. Yeah. Why? But you see, you see, not back in the, the year... Back in the year 2000, Go A King or Landmark Book published my books yep. in the yep. trilogy without any kind Precisely. of financial support. Because so I'm A looking King, for that kind of publisher. A King is a good guy. He knows about yep. these things. He understands the art. He understands the uh, literature. And he is with the private sector. Yep. Yeah. It's people like that you should go to. Maybe you should approach A King now. Good idea. Yeah. A, A King, of course, as you know, is also a poet. Yeah. Yeah. What's the situation in uh, Malaysia, Chai, uh, considering the publication of a uh, non Bahasa sort of text? I mean, not, not the ones in uh, Bahasa, uh, what, Malaysia or Bahasa Kabangsan or whatever? To my knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, the, the number of non Malay texts that have been sponsored by Devan Bahasa dan Pustaka mm -hmm. is minuscule. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now if you were to approach Dewan Bahasa dan Pustaka and ask them if they will publish your work, which is written in a non Malay language, mm -hmm. chances are you can forget about it. Lah. Oh. All right, I'm telling okay. you frankly. Yeah, okay, those in the old days, yes, when uh, Usman Awang was around, right, and uh, Baha Zain was around, uh -huh. all those guys, when they were more uh, multiracial in their outlook. Right. right yes they 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 were willing to 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 extend it to non malays uh-huh but those days are gone those guys are gone now the new generation they take a new nationalistic stance let's face it so there is the same distinction chai between national literature and what is known as I think the regional lit literature or something like that. Is I that hate right? that. I hate that. I know yeah. it is in the seventies. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. The 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 some some guy came up with. Uh, uh, I think it was Ismail Hussein, the professor. Ismail Hussein, Ismail correct, Hussein. correct. He came yeah. up and said that you know national literature in Malaysia should be that that is only written in Malay. Uh, the yeah. rest of it should be called uh, div sectional or communal sectional, literature. Sectional. What the hell? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, those people who write in other languages are not Malaysians, man. Don't they write yeah. about the Malaysian experience? Don't they yeah. owe their allegiance to Malaysia? How can you call them communal or sectional literature? Huh? They're also part of the national yeah. literature uh, scheme. So, so things that, haven't changed very always, much in Malaysia. I wrote against it many times, even in those days. So things haven't changed very much in Malaysia. No. Then. In fact, things are getting worse now. Let me tell you that. The racial no. situation in me, Malaysia is me getting ask, worse uh, now. I mean, polarization is getting worse. Yeah. Yes. Kapal was saying something, but Kapal, you have oh, disappeared. Okay. They're doing a Houdini okay. act again. Are you a magician now, Kapal? Uh, let, me, let me ask <laughs> That's a... Uh... <laughs> we still don't see you. Sorry, someone is asking <laughs> whether the questions posed by readers or people who listen to you uh, and the answers you give, do they make a real impact on the larger society? What? Sorry? Do questions raised by people from, you know, the readership or the viewership uh, and the answers you give, do they make an impact on the society at large? No. 
No. Why? Why? Because it's not disseminated widely enough. Because we don't have the channels. In other words, your media, media doesn't support you. Is that right? My what doesn't support me? Your media. No, of course not. But mm. because the media is controlled. Mm. Yeah. So Robert, would you say it's the same in Singapore? Well, of course Robert? the media, of course the media is controlled. Everybody knows that. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you, but you, what about the public? Does the public care? Does the public uh, stammer and clamor for real representation? <laughs> the public doesn't <laughs> care think, about literature. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. role is to ask you questions. <laughs> there, 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 there isn't a critical, critical core in Singapore that cares very much about these things. Mm -hmm. And you cannot depend on the straight times, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. in Singapore. Up to a point, you can. Mm -hmm. And you can't blame the public because it's more important for them to be able to put food on the table, especially in these pandemic times, you know, right. when people are going through hell and suffering. Right. You right. Know. Uh, literature and whatnot is the lowest in their concerns. Right. So we got a question from Kanan Chandran. Yeah, we got to we got to wrap up. The, the question that Kanan is basically asking is that if the readership and if the viewership asks questions, I mean, you know, the, the, the reference is to a very complex uh, challenge because I may ask a question of a writer, which is very personal to me, but should the writer's response be only for me or for the wider readership? And should my personal question become public as well? Uh, do you think we are ready for that kind of a level of debate and discussion? It all depends on how public is public, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, if I write for the Streets Times, I hope that as many people as possible will read me, but I really don't know who's reading me, you know. So which, leads really me to, so Robert, which leads me to ask both you and Chai whether you feel you're writing in a vacuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, we are because uh, let's face it. Whatever we we write will not change the world. I do not have any illusions about that at all. We only do what we can. We only do because we we want to express ourselves. We want to express what we think is our own personal truth. But right. even now, in this, our own personal truth is not the same truth as that of other people, especially in this uh, post-truth era, where you know. People have such divided uh, views about things now. Uh, okay, so uh, the uh, pandemic a has. Uh, huh? Correct. A following question would be Do you think social media might be the right uh, avenue for you to raise these issues? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it helps. Yeah, I do that too. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say also is that, you know, as this pandemic has actually borne it out very well that, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the post-truth era has, has, has really had an impact on how we think about things. There are people who say that the pandemic is a whole hoax, that it was created by governments <laughs> to scare people. Right, you know? right, and there are people right. who say that vaccinations are, are dangerous for you. you know? And yes. people actually believe that. I mean, yes, you look at America, for instance, it's so div divided now. Uh, you know, yeah. people say that Biden didn't win the presidency. It was a, a big steal. <laughs> and then there's the other group that says, you know, uh, uh, the claims that uh, Trump won. And that's people right. say that's the big lie. You know, yeah. he's telling the truth. You don't know anymore. You know, it's very hard now. Uh, okay, so very quick question uh, for both of you and a very quick answer. Because we're talking about truth and integrity. One, how do we define an integral truth? And two, if two truths are held by different parties to be truth, then what do we do? Robert, you go first. Can you rephrase your, your, your question? Because I, I would actually like to answer the question about whether we write in a vacuum or not. Can I oh, why don't you answer that then? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a, a little more optimistic than Chai because uh, quite recently, Chai, you probably know this because you've contributed to the book Robert Yeo at AT. And you would have read the testimonies of Su Chun Christine Lim, the novelist, who said that my play, Are You There, Singapore, influenced the way she wrote. I didn't know that. What did she say? 
that Are You There Singapore, the speech rhythms of Are You There Singapore influenced the way she wrote her novels. Okay. Ovidia Yu, the playwright, saw or watched One Year Back Home and she said that I also influenced her because I opened up some avenues for 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 uh, dramatic expression so i didn't know these things all right and when i read about this i was very very pleased because they delighted that i had influenced younger uh, uh writers okay i didn't know this at all until uh, their submissions came so try i unlike, unlike you i suppose i am I'm a, a little more uh, up optimistic but but the, the fact that before that i didn't know that i had been able that i was in a position when i influenced an influential novelist and a young playwright okay all right yeah i, I would say now that uh, we are we are what you know the huntington said that we would one day uh, see a clash of civilizations but today what we are seeing is a clash of truths and that poses a massive challenge for writers how do we deal with this situation? I suppose we have now to be more keenly aware of and sensitive to uh, how our expression of our own truth may be perceived, especially by skeptics opposed to our views. We need to find ways to overcome their opposition in order to win them over. Is okay, it so to here, here comes, right. So Chai, Robert, here comes a, uh, an interesting question. If we know that somebody is using free speech to express a non-truth, how do we handle that without appearing to be too censorious? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I don't know. I suppose continue to tell the truth. One of the two things that I was uh, had prepared to say was something that had to do with uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. And if you look at deniers of climate change, there are still people who deny climate change. Right. I would say I would look at the res reservoir Tangi in Singapore, where the government has established a solar farm. Yeah. Okay, and I will point out to things like this. This solar farm consists of thousands of panels that trap the sun's power. Okay, and some of these statistics are fantastic. There are 45 hectares of solar farm in Tengi Reservoir in Singapore, 45 hectares equals 45 football fields, okay? And they have enough power to uh, keep, they, have, they, they, they generate enough power to keep 17,000 cars off the road, things like that. So I will point to positive things that governments are doing, the Singapore government in particular, that fight that 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 tells you that climate change has to be fought against right that's the truth i think okay, okay. So, and the other thing of course has to do with COVID and the importance of masking social distancing and vaccination okay, okay. i could go on but i'll end there yeah Sure. Oh, it's very interesting. I mean, they have to, sorry, Chai, you want to come in? Yeah. Why are you uh, calling it off? It's only 7.59. We have until 8.30. So no, no, no. I, I was saying, uh, swapping this particular line of questioning. Because Even other Tahira questions is are coming raising in. her eyebrows. Sir. Why, what are you doing, man? No, no. Other questions short, are coming in. Other questions are coming in. One okay, of let, them let me, is... Can I just uh, address what Kanan Chandran is asking? Yep. Right? So he says that if free speech sometimes necessarily offends, must a line be Correct. drawn in the right to exercise I was free gonna, speech? I was going to ask you to do yes, that. Yes, yep. of course. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, there's mm. no such thing as absolute truth. You have to be aware of other people's sensibilities as well. You know, even as writers, you cannot just say, I have absolute freedom. I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. Do to hell with you. Yeah. Right. But, and also, uh, there's no such thing as absolute freedom. Uh, 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 he's also asking about uh, this. Uh, uh, where do we draw the line? Well, with yes. uh, community sentiment sensitivities, whether majority or minority, marginalized or whatever. I think it's when you you start to get personal and all that, then that's not right, lah. Yeah, and also uh, don't forget uh, 
in society, we also have libel laws, which prohibit us from say, doing certain things, from saying certain things. I mean, in the old days, when Najib uh, Razak was the Prime Minister of Malaysia, I always made sure that I never called him an idiot. I would say that he did idiotic things. That is fair comment, mm -hmm. right? But I will not call him an idiot because then I could be sued for libel. So we have right. to draw the line. Uh, also, uh, Kanan asked whether there's room for satire. Of course, in Malaysia especially, there's plenty of room for satire. You look at the absurd things these people in, uh, in the high places are doing, the play people in government <laughs> are doing. I mean, this girl, the former prime minister, huh? he was already a loser. He already let down the whole country huh? and he had to step down. And now he is appointed as the chairman of the National Recovery Council. What the hell? What's going on? This fellow already let down the whole country. You know, he couldn't control the COVID uh, spread and he, he, he couldn't <laughs> uh, uh, improve uh, the economy. And now he has stepped down already. He should be out. But so is said, your issue with him or is your issue with those who put him back in power? It is not, uh, of course, the people who put him back in power. And I'm sure he had a hand in this as well. He would have made a deal <laughs> with them. Come on, man. Okay, <laughs> la, I step down, but make sure you give me a minister. And this job ma, has got ministerial rank, you know. Mm. This means that we taxpayers have to pay for his minister's salary after he let us down. That's ridiculous, isn't it? What do you think, Singaporeans? Huh? Would you do that in Singapore? No, you're much cleverer than we are. Yeah, even your prime minister is much cleverer. He wouldn't do a thing like that. But you look at our new uh, supposed new prime minister. What does he do? He brings in the old, and look at his cabinet. It's still the same old, same old cabinet that led down the whole country with the, with the administration of, uh, of uh, the COVID uh, thing and, and also the, the way they let down the whole economy. And yet you're still having the same old cabinet. Doesn't make sense. Would you do that in Singapore, Robert? No. Kapal? Would you? No, no, we yeah, wouldn't. Exactly, precisely. So, but we are good neighbors, now. So we are good neighbors. We try not to interfere in the neighbors' satire. domestic affairs. Yeah. Huh? Sorry. I said we are good neighbors. So, like good neighbors, we try not to interfere in hey, the, the neighbors' so domestic polite, affairs. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on to another. I don't have to be politically issue. correct. <laughs> yeah, on to another issue because the yeah. the panel in the last three days we've been talking about integrity and truth. Where do you think there can be a line that is fairly visible uh, when we talk about truth and integrity? Because sometimes in our attempt to be integral, we cannot help but give offense because some truths are offensive, you know? And so I think a bit of training in uh, polite, courteous communication across cultures may be necessary like in all our schools, right? Robert, you wanna go ahead? I said a lot. I, I, I would want to ask uh, uh, whose truth are we, are we uh, uh, talking about? But and Robert, you know, I mean, when, when in Singapore, we know that people have been asking these questions, right? Exactly what you said, whose truth? And in Singapore now, we, you know, there even is talk about privileges that may be enjoyed by certain uh, ethnic groups and not by others. So these issues are slowly being made uh, public and articulated in public with, of course, a lot of politeness and um, you know, sensitivity and all of that. But it's very easy for these issues to get out of hand, I think. And that's where the worry lies. Yes. Yes. I think in, 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 in Singapore, uh, uh, our, our, uh, our debates, I think, uh, on the whole, uh, uh, too polite, this, I think, not enough. Mm. The engagement in the language is usually politically uh, correct. Mm. So if there's not enough engagement, then is issues are not fresh, and there, there is no 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 resolution. I think Singaporeans, no. are, uh, uh, compared to Malaysians, are, are generally more well behaved. La. In yeah. our case, uh, we don't care. La. I tell you, uh, things like, uh, for instance, uh, the new economic policy, which has gone on. Mm. Uh, it should have been terminated. Uh, it's affirmative action policy to help the Malays, which is the majority race in the country. And mm. uh, it should have been terminated in 1990, but it has carried on to this day. And it's not doing anybody any good. It's actually doing the Malays not good. 
it's, it's bad for them because then they get used to handouts. They get used to being helped. And so they, they cannot, they lose the competitive edge. So it's not good for them. I have said this uh, publicly, you know, I know it may be offensive. I, it's, it could be offensive to Malays, but the point is, if it's not going to help you, it's about time that you woke up to the reality that perhaps mm. that's not the way to go. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, a policy like the new economic policy doesn't hold anymore. It should be perhaps one that is not based on race, but based on your need, whether mm. you need it or not. And it doesn't matter who you are, you know, whether you're Ali, Achai, or, 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 or Siva. Manyam, yeah. Yeah, Manyam, <laughs> yeah. So that should be the way to go. And, and I have said that openly. I know it may offend some people, but that's, uh, that's how it goes. Chai, I want to say that I used to read your columns uh, when Najib was the Prime Minister and I admire them and often wondered how you can speak so openly and so freely. We, mm -hmm. couldn't, do, we couldn't do that in Singapore. We couldn't I, do that. I spoke openly because I chose to speak openly. Yeah. I didn't know what would come out of it. I didn't know what the repercussions might be. But I felt that I had to do what I had to do. I had to speak it out. And... Uh, there you go. I mean, I've called him, I've said uh, Najib, uh, when he was prime minister, I said Najib speaks with a forked tongue, which is the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, well, it may not be the objective truth, but that's the truth as I see it. And a lot of people agreed with me. All right. Uh, right. It, might, it could be a subjective truth, but still people agreed with me. He spoke with a forked tongue and he did certain things that were idiotic. That doesn't mean he was an idiot. Chai, uh, Chai and Robert, some of our listeners uh, and viewers want to know whether you, either of you or both of you believe in absolute truth. Is I there such a thing no, as absolute no, truth? No, 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 no. Why not? Objective truth, yes, you can have objective truth, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Lee Hsien Lung is now the Prime Minister of Singapore. Mm -hmm. That's an objective truth. That's fine. What, what about climate change is real? Is that an, an objective truth? No, that is now seen to be a subjective truth by some people, right? That vaccination can save lives. That's a subjective truth now. Oh, you are. <laughs> so we are faced with many kind of truth because as long it's as like... there are people who will view truth, all kinds of truth, Sorry, even objective, what we call objective truth as relative, we will right. have these problems. Objective right. truth is the U.S. Capitol was stormed on January 6th. Subjective truth is some people say it was an insurrection. Some people say they were doing a patriotic act, taking back the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but taking so. back the country from whom though, uh, Chai? Because uh, the people who are protesting from, are also their they own. They will say from the Democrats from the what is the group called? Uh, so fellow citizens la. From fellow citizens, la, yeah. I mean it's so, the same in Malaysia also what? Uh, the Muslims uh, have been indoctrinated with the idea that Islam is under threat. The Malays have been indoctrinated, 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 I say, yeah. That uh, the Malays are under threat. This is bullshit. You know, it's not true. But when people tell you that and they repeat it often enough, it becomes truth and people believe it. That is subjective truth. And that's the problem we face in this post-truth era. People choose to believe what they want to believe. What do you do about it? Mm. <laughs> I think you still have to keep, you know, banging your head against the wall and telling them, what you think is the truth. Otherwise, you will never bridge the divide. You tell, you tell the truth regardless, even if you are going to be denied funds, even if you are going to be censored. Precisely. You keep telling it. Yes. The that's truth what we according do. to you. Yeah. But what yeah. about the old uh, what about the old proverb, you know, one man's truth is another's poison. That's How what I've been saying all this time. With that? Huh? <laughs> That's what I've been saying all this time. That yeah. whatever you express is your own personal truth. It may not be agreed to by other people who have their own personal truths. And that's okay, right? That's you, you the way of the keep, world. But you have to keep doing it because that's your truth. Yeah, you have right. to keep plugging right. it. 
Right, right. The bridge. So the, the, the question that this whole issue then leads to is, is there a need for censorship? Because if my truth is not your truth and your truth is not her truth, then it's okay to articulate whatever we feel like, right? Yeah, but the problem with censorship is who does the censoring? Mm. And that's where the problem lies. An agreed to elected body, perhaps? Oh, come on. This elected body, you cannot put faith in them. Right? They have their own agenda. They have their own then personal you... interest. They will serve their own personal self-interest. Okay, so is there a society on earth that has a system of censorship which is uh, free of prejudice? Not that I'm aware of. You, I don't think Robert? so. I don't think uh, so. Which means that we are all in some ways subject to this uh, unfortunate reality la, that uh, no matter what we do, some people will be offended, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So usually people will say if the majority is not offended, it's okay. Or if a significant minority is not offended, then it's okay. Which means that the poor, the weak, and the helpless will always be ridden over, right? Because We never they... said that. We mm. never said that. No, no, I know you haven't said that. But what I mean is in the general belief of, you know, uh, how do these very, very small minorities protect themselves from being misrepresented? They also have to speak up. They have to speak out against tyranny. And that, that is what here in Malaysia, some of us have been doing mm. for decades, Kapa. For mm. decades, you would understand it. Of course, of course. Yeah. You coming you from see, Singapore, you would understand it. Maybe you don't say it as loudly as we do because you are more restricted there. Because <laughs> the government watches you too closely. Too mm. closely. Yeah. Also, but I think here, the, uh, we don't the, care. The, we just say, God damn it. Sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> but because, you know, in KL, you, you don't like KL or Subang, you go to Pahang somewhere or Tringano and enjoy That's the not beach the point. and all that. That's not the point. <laughs> you go to Pahang also, you can be ferreted out. But if but you really are moved like... to say it, and if you think that what you're saying is the right thing to do, you just do it. But I think, I think now the new temperament, and I don't know what Robert, whether you agree with me, Robert, but I think in Singapore, lately we've enjoyed a fairly good uh, reach in terms of freedom of expression, right? Well, you're trying to defend Singapore now. <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to I, defend because it is right. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's Come like on, that. I, I think, Come I think, on, la. <laughs> I think on they the whole- from across the causeway what it's like. We, <laughs> We have, a, no, no, let, let we have a good government, a better government than in Malaysia. That's true. Yeah. That's so, true. Less, less room to criticize the government because they're doing most of the right things in Singapore. Oh, no, 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 no. Doesn't mean that if they do the right things in Singapore that there's less room to criticize them. They should still be open to criticism. <sighs> They are and, open to criticism, are, yeah. but are, uh, they will they be not as broad and as fiery and as direct as in Malaysia. Yes. Like Malaysia. I said, Chai, we couldn't say the things you said about Najib. Because, because you are conditioned no. already. You're I conditioned to be well behaved. I don't think we have the kind of excesses <laughs> that we see in Malaysia, Chai. Come on. <laughs> right? The kind of what? Excesses we see in Malaysia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but when there I mean, is... the, the IMDB scandal is incredible. That's it's, true. And it's, it's still not resolved. And Amno is back in power. Yep. Please don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> But I think Malaysia is also a much bigger, bigger country with many more millions, uh, and therefore true, the, uh. yeah, the the contrasting uh, forces at work are much more complicated and complex. I think, yeah. But don't be surprised. I mean, uh, even if you are a, a total unknown and you uh, you were to post something on Facebook that is deemed to be insulting to royalty, you'll get hauled up. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you are. Even in Malaysia, big as it is, as you say, comparatively, 
So Chai, that, that is a colonial hangover, right? Even in Britain, you cannot really say anything against the Queen as a sovereign. But you can say a lot of things against the Prime Minister. Uh, here we cannot also. Oh. We, we, the, there was recently a case where the uh, Mantri Basar of Kedah mm -hmm. was uh, criticised. And the guy who did the criticising got hauled up. Right. Can you imagine that? Mantri Basar only, la, Chief Minister of the state. So well, the Mantri Basar is a political appointment or a non-political, like a sovereign appointment? Uh, it's, a, it's a political appointment, Mantri Basar. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know the complexity of Malaysian politics that much. Yeah, yeah. Chief Minister. La. Chief Minister mm -hmm. of the state. La. If your party like wins a, the state, then you, 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 your, you the, the, the party that wins the state will choose somebody to become the Menteri Besar or the Chief yeah. Minister. Yeah. But Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Singapore, we are okay to say if we feel that the Prime Minister can do a better job than he's doing, right? <laughs> Yes, I think so. But who is saying? Oh it? yeah, sure, sure. You can do a better <laughs> well, job. Sure, that's all right. That's I suppose not bad. you can see it on social media. You, you, you know. <laughs> but can you say the prime minister speaks with a forked tongue? Ah, that's the challenge. But but if you say I don't that, think you can I, say I think that. you can say it. But there might be a, a chance that he might hold you to court, right? Yeah, that's the mm. thing. And ask you to prove that. Like, whether he has a forked tongue or you're making it up, right? No, when you say he says speaks with a forked tongue, you can prove it because it's fair comment. Yeah. In legal terms, it is fair comment because he has said this and then he never carried it out. He promised this thing and then he reneged on it. Is that the definition of a forked tongue? I mean, if you lie, la, a forked tongue means you lie. La. If you say you didn't steal money, from one MDB, but you actually did that speaking with a fork tongue also, what? Well, right? in Singapore, we don't have a one MDB, but uh, so because I- Because you don't I, dig there enough, dig, dig deep enough. You dare not dig deep enough. No, you won't have the avenue to dig deep enough. You won't be given the chance to dig deep enough. You dig one inch of uh, ISD comes on you already, right not? I don't know, Robert, you got more experience with this than me, man. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> No, I don't have I think, more experience. I think the ISD in Singapore is pretty vigilant and really? they will come and ask you questions if they feel that you are unnecessarily giving cause for offence. Precisely. So you dig one inch, they'll come and ask you questions already. Could be. They if that one inch is dangerous, yeah, because water levels are very, very uh, widespread. Some places is only one inch. Some places you can go one foot, <laughs> right? <no? laughs> so imagine uh, if you were to dig one inch on a Singapore I one MDB case, huh? You can't. After one inch, one foot only, you cannot really. Yeah. So how can you yeah. get to the one MDB case? No. That's why it's different. Uh. It's different I understand it. Different. I understand it. I know you are you're you're more uh, you know restricted. We've always known that. But also I think Chai, in our own way, we are much more vigilant and we keep a very sharp eye on um, the higher place public officers, yeah. And we are very quick to, uh, I suppose, uh, quote unquote, punish errant uh, behavior at that level. And we are quite effective in doing so. Yeah. Therefore, that serves as a deterrent. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's I really think good. we also have a government with a very strong majority. Correct. Unlike in Malaysia. That can be a problem also. La. That can right. be dangerous too. La. Because then they can bulldoze anything through parliament. That's what we had in the old days when the Barisan national government used to have a two-thirds majority in parliament. Anything they want to bulldoze through, they can get it passed. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds majority, they have it. You see, to the detriment of the society. So uh, if I may interrupt, there's a question from uh, you know, one of the uh, persons uh, viewing us and listening to us. How much do you think it depends on how the truth is communicated? Meaning that <clears throat> we both could agree that water is wet, but how we communicate that truth becomes either offensive or not offensive. So it's the words that we use, the language and the tone that we use. I think that's quite a subtle uh, issue and a challenge, right? To most of us who are interested in the integrity of truth. Yep. Yeah. 
as I said before, lah, there are many ways to skin a cat, lah. Betul, so, betul. If you want, but to, cats have nine lives. So after you skin them nine times, then how? Habis lah. <laughs> Find other lives, lah. Come on, come Mantos, on. Lah, after that. <laughs> I Robert, think it's. I think you, it's, it's. I think it's important to have a a. How shall I put it? Uh, in a more educated uh, audience, whether they read newspapers or they read things online or they watch Channel News Asia, to be able to sift and make sense of what a, is communicated. So I think I would say a more educated electorate would be very important for me. That's true because uh, actually uh, democracy doesn't really work in our parts. Uh. Yeah. Mm. Unless we have a really highly educated electorate. Uh. Correct. You know, when it comes to elections, uh, you know, the idiot also gets the same one vote as uh, the educated guy, you know. And that's where the problem lies. So uh, those people who want to win votes, uh, they work on the idiots, uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So democracy doesn't work in that sense. And then uh, in our case also, democracy doesn't work because the people who are elected, uh, when they go into parliament or the state assembly, uh, they don't look after you. They look after their own self-interest. You know, this representation by uh, one man for so many people, he doesn't represent you. Come on, let's face it. He represents himself most of the time. So if he's good for his self-interest, that's how but he Chai, goes. I mean, to be absolutely uh, fair, it is, uh, I don't think there's any society in the world where every single citizen has the capacity or the power or the will to do everything that uh, a designated minister or, or secretary might be able to do. Lah. Therefore, we all elect representatives, right? And if yeah. we elect a representative that we feel has not lived up to our expectations, then we don't elect him or her the next time around, right? That's how that's, democracy works. That's easier said than done. Lah. That's easier mm -hmm. said than done. Mm -hmm. lah. Because you may not vote for him, but other people vote for him. That's what democracy is all about. Unless you want to go back to autonomous leadership, lah, right? Then I mean, I make you you look at this guy, Ismail Sabri, who is not a prime minister of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. I don't consider him my prime minister. He's not my mm -hmm. prime minister. Mm -hmm. I didn't vote for him. I didn't mm -hmm. vote for his party to be in power. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you call dem democracy. What kind right. of democracy is that? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, a well-known Singaporean by the name of Kanan Chandran, uh, whom I think uh, we all know, He's asking right that an educated uh, Singaporean or educated uh, electoral person is not necessarily a thinking person. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, well, you, you look can, at you, the ministers in Malaysia, you compare them with the ministers in Singapore, you look at their educational record. Uh, Ayo, Malaysians are uh, bury their heads in shame. Uh. Ayo. Many of your ministers, they have very good degrees. You know, they go to Harvard, they go to LSE, they go to Cambridge, they go to God knows where. Uh, some of the Malaysian ministers don't even have a degree. But some of them from, I don't know, some half past six university, like the Thames Valley University law degree. I don't know where. Have you heard of Thames Valley University? No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and some of them even forge it, you know. They even forged them uh, the certificates, and it has become have it been exposed publicly. So right, right. I agree with you, Kanan. Kanan is he the writer, Kanan Chandra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The editor of Storm Magazine. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm. So, in addition right. to having a more educated electorate, you have a more educated leadership. Yes, you need right? that. Right. You need that. You need that. Yes. In uh, Socrates, uh, you know, in his Republic, I mean, Plato outlined the whole idea of the philosopher king, right? They were a select breed of wise, unfortunately, wise men. I mean, I think our female uh, partners would be a bit <laughs> abhorred by that, but times have changed. So do you think in terms of our closing remarks on this, uh, do you think a sensible council of wise 
men and women might also serve a very useful purpose. I think many democracies have this, but they may not enjoy direct uh, power and control, but they sort of uh, wheel from the back, like they wheel from, uh, you know, on the sidelines, they, they are more influencers rather than, uh, and not influencers not to be confused with the new social media influencers, uh, which are very pop, uh, you know, but in terms of, um, you know, these uh, guys on the sidelines who are not directly participants of the uh, active political, uh, you know, fray, but they nevertheless uh, offer the advice. I think it is, it is good to have this kind of counsel. I mean, in Singapore, while the president is sovereign, uh, in, in our case, we have a female as a president, she is also guided by a council of presidential advisors in terms of the decisions that she has to make. Lah. Yeah. I'm sure you have the same equivalents at some place, right? At some level, Chai, in no, Malaysia? No. You don't? I'm, I'm always very wary of uh, an, an instituted body of this so-called council of, uh, you know, uh, of wise men. It reminds me very much of what Mahathir has been pro proposing. A council of elders uh -huh. is always very suspicious. Okay. Can't have all right, guys. Uh, all Robert Chai, it's been so wonderful to have you guys speaking and all of that. You have uh, two minutes each to wrap up and say your final comments about our topic on truth, integrity, and the freedom that writers enjoy. Robert uh, Chai, you want to go first? Robert, la. okay, uh, Robert, Robert. Uh, Chai, you go, go first, ahead. Okay? I haven't, I haven't sort of thought about wrapping up. Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh you are to carry oh, on. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I haven't thought about wrapping up. So maybe, maybe to no, no. I haven't thought about wrapping up. Maybe Chai, you, 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 you go on. I, okay, I, Chai. I, I mean, uh, well, I think we have said all that we have to say, you know. Uh, and I, I just feel that uh, if you are a writer and you want to speak the truth, you have to just continue carrying carrying on doing so uh, on your own steam. And uh, you cannot expect uh, people to help you along the way. You know, it's for least of all the government. You just have to to do what you think is right and to express what you think is true. And and and, and if there okay. are people who don't agree with you, you just have to accept it because this is a yeah. big world. And uh, sure. uh, and we, we, we you know, uh, th that's how the world works and that's how life is. Sure. Yeah, okay. I'd okay. like to say that uh, uh, I will go on writing and expressing the truth as I see it. Um, if uh, it cannot attract funds from the government, I will go to other sources more simple. Whoa, to where to go? <laughs> well, okay, yeah. Well, friends, why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? You know what, Robert? I've yeah. had to do that for a couple of projects recently. I wanted to stage my play, The yes. Saltfish Plus Concubine. I had to go uh -huh. around begging for money from my old friends, from my old schoolmates, from other people. And recently, recently also, when I wanted to write a biography of an opposition politician, I went around also to beg for money from people I knew. You know, that's the only way to go. The right. last people I would like go and ask for money from is the government. Right. And right. they wouldn't give me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't. <laughs> they will give you money. No, I, 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 I believe that if there are friends, corporations that believe in what you say and what you say is important to them, they will support you. I do yeah. not believe in funding my own publication. To me, that is an ego trip. So Fair I enough. wait patiently. I right. mean, you know, I waited two years to publish the fifth book of poems, memoirs two, and my essays, two right. years. Right. I think right. I can. Okay. I, well, I, I uh, think thanks, I can. Uh, I can. I can wait until something comes along. That's. Okay. But don't wait too please. long, Robert. Um, Robert Chai, it's been a great pleasure and a privilege for me to host both of you on this wonderful final and concluding um, panel. 
of discussion organized by Tahiran's wonderful program that has run over three days. So before we enter the closing ceremony, I really want to thank both of you from the bottom of my heart. I remember in an early poem written more than half a century ago, I said in that poem that my lie, and I'm quoting, my lie is also my truth told differently. So I think that in a sense may sum up quite a lot of our writers' um, way of communicating and conveying things. Uh, sometimes to be overly direct may also not be the best uh, strategy. So uh, as we move in a world which is very driven by strategic considerations, maybe uh, we writers can also take a tip from the writers of uh, you know corporate brochures and all of that. So <laughs> please, no way, no way, come on. So thank you very much. And, uh, thank you guys who've been participating and listening to us and all of that. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And uh, Tahira, can I hand everything over to you now, my dear? Thank you, it's been fun. Yeah, thank yeah, you, yeah, but thanks, guys.